I'm Jay Fernandez. Welcome to this rare in the trenches look at the craft of screenwriting. Today I'm sitting here with screenwriter director Ed Solomon who wrote and directed the drama Levity. He's also written the screenplays for Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Men in Black and Leaving Normal. He's recently adapted the novel Tokyo Sucker Punch. Ed, thanks for being here. My pleasure, thank you. So you originally come from the world of comedy, right? Uh, the world of comedy, yeah. It's a Not the neighborhood. No, the whole world, yeah. Okay, great. It's a crazy place, <laughs> with a K. And uh, you're a joke maker, generally, right? <laughs> yes. You can uh, see where this is going, right? <laughs> <laughs> where did levity come from? Well, first of all, everyone always asks me that question. Like, why would you want to do a movie like that when you've always been doing stuff like this? So it's a dumb question, right? It's a really dumb okay. question. Okay, all right. Yeah, I there are no dumb questions. Like yeah, that. just really stupid really dumb ones. Questions. Yeah, yeah. Sure. No. <laughs> um, no, I understand the question. I mean, the truth is, in my life, I I've written all sorts of stories and all sorts of you know plays and different movie scripts. And you know, sometimes the movies get made and sometimes they don't get made. But you know, a lot of different stories have always really interested me. Um, this one really interested me. It's all the way back from when I was in college. I used to work at a youth prison. I was a, um, a volunteer and we used to tutor English and math. And these were all kids who had committed violent crimes as kids or teenagers. And this one guy that I was working with um, had killed someone when he was 17. He killed a 16 year old. And uh, this guy that I was working with had been sentenced. He'd been tried as an adult and then sentenced to life in prison. And uh, during our entire time when I was working with him, he kept a photograph with him of the person he killed. And he would constantly be looking at it. And, and I asked him, I said, what, you know, what is that? We weren't even supposed to talk about what they had done. We were only supposed oh, really? to be. Oh, really? Yeah, we were oh, only okay. supposed to be. You you know, to... But I was really, like, it seemed to be a real thing for him. He kept taking it out of his pocket. He would unfold it. Um, and he told me that what had happened. And he said that the judge had not just, but he had been sentenced to life. The judge had said as part of his punishment, he had to, uh, he had to physically manipulate, hold all these items of the, of the, the boy he killed. He had to, I remember him saying specifically, like, like he made me throw his football, he said. He had to put on his jacket, he had to wear his things. And My the judge goodness. was, I think, trying to, impart upon this kid the notion that he had actually taken a, a life. And I think this kid staring at this photo constantly was a way to try to understand the, the magnitude, I guess, of what he had done. Well, anyway, he was there for only a few weeks, and then he turned 18, and then he went to prison, where he may still be, I don't know. Oh, wow. Um, That's intense. Yeah, it was really intense. It also seems almost like a, a, I mean, it's meant to be a punishment, but almost that that's a psychological torture to, I mean, he's probably already tortured, but to, to make him try to inhabit that. Well, I don't know whether it was a, 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 attempted to be something to really punish him or to make him just understand what he had done. But that image of this guy in this photo stayed with me for a long time. I still remember that photo very clearly. Yeah. And that photo, the photo from the movie was as close as I could to, you know, to replicate that photo oh, you actually from tried my to memory. It. Wow. As I remember the photo, I mean, yeah. who knows how it really evolved over because that was 25, 26 years ago. Um, also, in my, uh, when I was a kid, just one town over, um, someone had, uh, had robbed a liquor store. And uh, in fact, it was the brother of a kid who went to my, to my school, to my junior high. And uh, there were three guys, and they'd shot someone, you know. And somehow that image of what had happened in the, in the, um, in the robbery, uh, it's always kind of lingered with me. And then at about mid-'80s, I had this idea to write this story. And it took me a while. I started it and stopped it and started it and stopped it. And every time I'd start writing it, I'd get 20, 30, 40 pages into it, and I would just go, ah, oh, this doesn't feel right, it's not real enough, or it's not, you know, it didn't c capture the mood enough, or just, and I put it aside, and I started again, you know. Finally, um, God, I don't know when, I mean, finally, in the, just after I finished the Men in Black screenplay, I thought, now I'm gonna really write this, and, and write it all the way to the end, and I did. I'd written that, and I'd written a couple other scripts. What, 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 what helped, I mean, what do you think had changed that you were, what you were able to, to push through? Well. 
I thought that because it seemed like Men in Black was going to be a successful movie, that maybe I'd have an easier time getting this movie set up and made. Oh, okay. You know? And I thought if I, you know, maybe the success of, you know, Men in Black might allow me to get something less, you know, less commercial. And I've done that a lot of times. It's work, work on something, a studio movie that at least gets me a little bit of money in the bank and, you know, and then I'll spend like all of my money trying to get something else made or all of my, you know, the next year working on something that I love that no one else seems to, to like, you know, and it's this constant <laughs> cycle. It's actually kind of frustrating. Frankly, yeah, because well, because you can't predict how things are going to go. I mean, what if Men in Black had bombed or, you know? Yeah, who knows? I mean, you can't predict anything at any point. You never know, you know, just because something's fun to write, it doesn't always mean it's a good script. Just because a movie is fun to shoot doesn't mean it's going to end up being a good movie. Just because it's a good movie, it doesn't mean people will see it as good. I mean, it's really strange. Also, just because a movie is reviewed well doesn't mean it will hold up as a good film, and vice versa. I mean, the first movie that I ever had made was eviscerated by critics. Um, it was a movie that I wrote with Chris Matheson called, that you mentioned at the beginning, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Right. People hated that movie. And then the second movie that, that we did, the second Bill and Ted movie, got really, for some reason, well-reviewed. But I didn't think it was as good a film, nor has it held up over time. But for some weird reason, the, the first Bill and Ted movie, I don't know, it just seems to have sat in a little bit of yeah, a better place. Yeah, a bit and, of a cult to yeah, following. in and, people's memories, you know. Right. Um, it, in fact, when, when Bill and Ted first came out, it was reviewed so badly that critics were referring to it in reviews about other movies. You know, like a week later, I remember that one of the Friday the 13th movies came out. And I think it was whatever, Jason Takes Manhattan. Manhattan. Yes. And exactly. the end of the review, the critic said, here's an idea, how about Jason Takes Bill and Ted? Oh, no. And I was thinking, oh, come on. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, that seems a little harsh. I know, I know. Jeez. But whatever. What anyway. can you do? Well, you, you mentioned that was, the, that was the first one that you had produced, right? Bill and Ted, yeah. Right. How yeah. many feature scripts had you written before that point? Bill and Ted was a little bit of a fluke. I had, in college, I had written jokes for comedians and I wrote um, plays and wrote a few plays and, and some jokes. And one of the comedians that I was doing a little bit of writing for uh, introduced me to a TV producer who came to see a play I wrote and he hired me as a staff writer on Laverne and Shirley, which oh, was, wow. that, I mean, that was, you know, an interesting experience. I was young and I, I that didn't... That was your first professional writing paycheck, right? Yeah, it went from like being kind of funny in the dorms and goofing around with friends to having to be funny like professionally and on the mark and churn out a, a lot of material in a short amount of time. And it was kind of overwhelming. So I thought, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can write at that level of comedy with, you know, at that pace. So afterwards I, I wrote a spec script and another spec script which um, I think were pretty bad. And in hindsight, I mean, actually, okay, the truth is they were bad. I, they were bad scripts. And I, I've re actually looked through one of them not that long ago. I said, let me just see now, what was I thinking as a, right. when I first started, see if I like had some spark that That's I, interesting, you know. Yeah. And I was looking through it and I was like, no, there's no, no spark. <laughs> there, was, there was nothing here to, to pretend. No, that, just nothing, right? nothing that was, you know, just nothing. But I had had an, but I had an agent and they, had, they were sending it out a little bit here and there. And then Chris and I, Chris Matheson and I wrote, uh, just on a lark, we decided to take these characters that we had done in a little improv, um, just a little improv group together that we both played. Chris played Bill and I played Ted. And we liked doing them so much that we actually screwed around as Bill and Ted for a while. We decided to take these characters and uh, just see what would happen if we made them into like a longer thing. And we, we just started laughing and laughing with no idea if anyone would ever buy it, let alone ever read it. You know, we just, just made us laugh and it was kind of fast. I mean, we just started bombing through it. And then my agents decided it would be, you know, career suicide to send it out. So they sat on it for a few months. And then uh, I had one of those meetings where I went in and I said, uh, I, I, the intention was to go in and say, I really want you guys to send this script out. But I ended up going in and saying, if you don't send this out, I'm leaving. <laughs> and, you know, gave him this big impassioned p 
pitch to them about why I thought we could sell this and it was a good script and it was funny and all this and just it's like talking to Mount Rushmore and ended with, <laughs> right. well, it was good working with you and, you know, <laughs> good luck in the future. <laughs> I was like, oh man, I went out to Chris, he goes, how'd it go? Oh man, <laughs> was like, how was that? Yeah. Delivering that it was awesome, Chris. Uh, good news, we can find new agents, you know. Right, <laughs> right. Like, right. So, um, but we did find there was an agent who did seem to respond to it. And then, and then that uh, got us some, Chris and I as partners, got us a little bit of some notoriety around town as writers, and um, we started getting jobs from there. What made you think you could write in that format to begin with? I got into writing completely bass backwards, as they say. It just, you know, I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know who I was as a person. I didn't know what I wanted to say as a writer. I didn't know, you know, I didn't have a deep understanding of literature or what was possible or anything. So, you know, a bunch of my friends were all kind of going into writing and I, I knew I wanted to write something, but I didn't know what. I didn't know what was possible. I didn't really know a lot of movies. I didn't watch a lot of movies other than, you know, movies that we'd just go to as kids or my dad would take me or something. Um, and even prior to that, I mean, in high school, I just had a lot of really talented friends who were all singers and actors and musicians. And I didn't have any actual talent that I was aware of. So I just thought, well, maybe I'll be the writer comedy guy, which really was a, just me desperate for attention, you know, wanting to be liked. and. Then, went, then came college and um, you know, I knew that I liked comedy and I liked um, hanging around funny people and I started to gravitate toward people that were really funny and then I started actually, you know, I went to the comedy store one night and I heard that, they were look, that Jimmy Walker was looking for comedy writers so I submitted jokes to Jimmy Walker and then I started writing jokes for him. So then I was like in this joke writing world and thought, well that seems kind of cool but I knew that, you know, obviously you can't really make a living or a life doing that. So then I got, I got, I got into writing plays because a lot of friends of mine in college were doing plays, so I sort of do that. And then that led to the TV job, and I got into that, and I realized this is really hard and wasn't really that great an experience for me. So it just seemed like, well, maybe I'll, maybe writing movies is the right thing. So then I got hired, and Chris and I set up Bill and Ted. So then I was on this sort of writing movies track, and it took me, God, I don't know, probably a decade before I felt like I actually understood the f format and understood. Really? Yeah, I always felt, always, always felt that I was, you know, just hanging on to the bottom rung of a ladder that was like a fire truck ladder that was swinging around yeah. a corner and I was just like Harold Lloyd, you know, trying to not <laughs> get flung off, you yeah. know? And that sooner or later I was hoping to get on to a rung and get a sense of purchase somewhere, but. Was there a sense that you always would? Or no. was it more the sense that no. at any moment you were? For most of my career, I really have felt, um, and, I, and I say it's weird to say, not in an insecure, neurotic way, but in an actual sense that this was true. Like it felt like this was genuinely true, which is I always felt like I was this close to, you know, to not knowing what I was doing, you know, this close. I was just holding on by the seat of my pants, you know. I used, to, um, I used to feel that every job I got, I, you know, I was bound to be fired from, you know? And it didn't happen. But I always felt like I was just barely figuring this out. And then, of course, you finish. And I'm sure a lot of the folks on your program are saying the same thing. You finish a project, you put it aside, you sort of put it past, you know, you begin something new, and that feeling comes back again, which is, uh, you know, how do you do this? How do you... How do you, how do you write? You know, what do you, what do you do first? You know, what? And part of that, I think, is because every project wants to be written in a different way. I really think every oh, okay. project has its own f organic, uh, you know, need, and that that you're going to somehow try to understand to give it its its own life. Interesting. So you don't just see it as you know applying your voice to whatever that story is. You think you actually adapt. For me, that would never work. Mm -hmm. First of all. My voice is almost irrelevant, I think. You know, no, who cares about my voice? I wish that were true. You know, I wish, I think in my earliest tart parts of my life, the earliest parts of my career, I would have loved that my voice would have been 
something really special. I would have loved the idea that at the end of my life I'd have a body of work that would reflect my voice. But it's pretty clear to me now in the sort of middle part of my life, that's not gonna happen. You know, I've got a few pieces of work here and there that I'm proud of. I'm really proud of a lot of the scripts I've written, but the final products, you know, I'm proud of this part of this movie and this part of that movie, and hey, I think I got that part right, or I think they got that part right, or. But you're looking at that from the final product standpoint, right? The yeah, but nobody sees, screen. sorry to interrupt you, but nobody sees the scripts, you know? Yeah, right. I wish they did, I wish they could read it and make a decision for themselves, hey, you know, because the thing about screenwriting is you go through the motions as though what you're creating is, is a piece of art. It's, there's nothing different about writing a screenplay uh, to writing you know, a novel or, or, or even maybe even painting a picture in some ways in that I think to do it well, you, you, you go really deep inside yourself. You, you work really hard to bring it out. You have to bring all of the tools at your possession. Uh, you, know, bring, you have to bring them all forward and you use them to try to then craft something that not only is a representation of this part of you, but also that speaks to other people in a way that's entertaining to them, uh, not indulgent, not boring, um, and meaningful, you know? Um, you do all that, and then you give it to someone else and go, well, you know, good luck with that. And, you know, if, if any of this helps you in your movie, I hope that's great, and if it doesn't, you know, do whatever you need to do. You know, it's, 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 a, it's ultimately kind of a lie at the end of the day. 99% of your time is spent by yourself constructing this thing. Um, but that's just the beginning of the movie, you know? Um, so toward that end, to the extent that someone has made something of mine, well, I'm really appreciative, grateful now. And now, having had it happen a few times, I realize how unusual it is to have it done well. More often happens the other way. I think so, just because it's so hard to make movies. It's not because everyone out there is a big hack or they're all lame or they never understood what I was trying to do. It's just really hard to make a movie work. There, you know, there are infinitesimal little decisions along the way that are constantly made. And it's very hard to construct this piece organically so that by the end, when it's done, it's actually something good and beautiful and work that works, you know? But at any point along that way, one decision can come in that's fatal. Hmm. What if we just change this? Or I think the tone should be this. Or what if we cast this? Or we just cut this little piece out. Or we need, you know, little things that seem little at the time, but they can just veer it off and it can go sour in any way. with Levity because you directed it? Do you feel like there were more moments of satisfaction in the final product, product because you had control or that much more control? Well, I feel like I had a lot more control over it, partly because it was made for so little money that nobody was looking over our shoulders. Okay. Nobody. I, I don't think anybody ever. Well, first of all, nobody gave us a script note or a- You kidding? Never, not one or a, a, a note on the cu cut of the movie, nothing, never, from anyone. Who did you do it for? Who was the producer in the, in the studio? Well, um, we didn't get a distributor until it was done. We had gotten some money from Studio Canal for foreign sales, and we got a little bit of money from Columbia TriStar Home Video for domestic. Okay. And that was very little. So basically, I think it was about, their business plan was get these stars on a video box and put it in, a video and and not um, not worry about whether we have a release because we their feeling was we put so little up front just you know as long as we sell a few videos it'll be fine my hope was that it would get some distribution which it did Sony Classics came and picked it up and distributed it on a kind of limited basis so at least it got into some theaters but it had but it never had any overseer you know no like never had any overseer did. so I mean to the extent that it, you don't like the movie you know, I, I would take responsibility for that because there wasn't somebody who made me do stuff. There were exigencies of production and certain things, you know, budget issues where I had to make changes to what right. I originally saw, but I did it all, you know. But on the whole, I mean, it was, it was generally more satisfying because of that? It was satisfying, it was hard, you know. It was, it was hard for a lot of reasons, but it was satisfying, sure. Um, however, 
when the film is done, there's another thing which happens, which is it has its own life. It, it accrues to be something out of your control. It just, it, you finish it and there's, this is the film that I intended to make, but then when others watch it, you know, they take it and it becomes whatever they think it's gonna be. And you know, there's just as little control in a weird way. <laughs> you have a little more control over the final product, but not how it lives in people's minds. And, and you know, at the end of the day, you just end up, I feel, I end up with a series of films. I don't include levity in this, by the way, but as a screenwriter, a series of films for which I'm credited, none of which truly represent what I intended to do. Some are a little bit better. Most are not what I had hoped. But a lot of them, too, are just films that I have my name on because I worked for a few weeks on or this and that. So you end up, there's sort of two individuals here. There's, there's me who spends most of my time in my office writing, trying to create something that I feel really works and that I'm really proud of. And then there's whatever people do with it over here and the movie that it becomes. And then even further detached, whatever critics might say or an audience might think or even further away, how it might live, if it even does live on, in people's memories. How did you, you know, from being funny in college and then writing on Laverne and Shirley, how did you learn how to translate comedy to a screenplay? I mean, what are the tricks or, or how did you develop that, your, your comedic voice? Because it's a different animal, obviously, when you're writing dialogue. And... I think the easiest thing to remember about writing comedy is if it genuinely makes you laugh, has a better shot of making other people laugh. If, if it doesn't make you laugh, but you think it'll make other people laugh, it's probably not going to. The other thing about it is, I think, I think it takes a certain amount of energy to write comedy, and you have to be willing to really push yourself. You have to be really willing to go places that you're not entirely comfortable. And when I see a lot of writers, especially comedy writers, get very comfortable, this is what I do. This is my style. This is why when you said the thing about your own voice, I was like, oh, no, that's not, I don't want to ever be that guy who goes, I just sort of put my voice into this thing. Once they start doing that, it's never funny anymore. Never. And I think there's a kind of um, discomfort that comes with, with comedy of some kind or another. And I think you have to really be pushing yourself to get there, I think. And, um, you know, how do you, access that continuously, I, I don't know. Is it easier to do that in, is comedy a more collaborative? Like take for example, you, you worked on Gary Shandling, right? Yeah. Like how, did, how did that work in the writer's room? Well, the show that I worked on was, it's Gary Shandling's show. And that was, um, I did that for three years. And that was a really great experience. There was a lot of really funny people working on there. We'd work around a room, like most television shows, had a big punch up table. Um, but describe that. What? I think most shows work more or less the same way. Basically, uh, you sort of break down the season. Let's say you know you're going to go for a whole season. So you break down, this is the basic arc of the season. We sort of see it going this way. Uh, you then try to break down certain stories and usually they get assigned out to either the members of the staff or occasionally outside writers because the staff can't write all of them. Then people come in with first drafts and then everyone reads them and the people who run the show usually give notes. Um, okay, we think it should go this way, this way, or this way. Either they go back to the writer and say, can you do some more work? Or it comes to the table where people, what they call, they pitch on it. You know, they'll, they'll throw ideas around and then the script starts to really take its shape. And then of course, once those scripts start to take their shape, the show really starts to get its voice. And then it starts to get to this level where, okay, now we're starting to really hear the characters and the, the show has its own feel. And then the next episode gets really affected by that. Right. So then, which makes it harder and harder for outside writers to hear the voice of a, of a specific show because it starts to get particular to the show itself. That's when the show, that's when it gets really fun is because it starts to tell you what it is, which is the same thing that happens in screenwriting, by the way. You get into that place where the piece starts to dictate in a way. Although it's not dictation so much like you're taking just t literally, right. it's speaking to me, I'm channeling Wouldn't it, which I think is- if it were that easy. Would be great. But anyone who says that I think is, you know, worthy of getting, you know, the big sock with horse manure in the head. But anyway, the show starts to really 
tell you what it's becoming and you, you start to, you know, I don't know, that's when it gets really fun. But the punch up table, is that? The is punch up that, table is like the a group of touches? people, usually the staff writers and sometimes one or two or three people who come in for one or two days a week to do specifically punch up. Those are those joke people that you were talking about earlier. Um, that is, we, we put the script out in front of us and we just try and always find better jokes, better jokes, better jokes. Sometimes uh, because of a read through or a run through, you know that whole sections aren't working. Then either someone who works on the show or one of these one day or two day consultants who might be more objective can say, you know what the problem is, this, and it needs this. And then you come in and go, okay, we need three more scenes written. That means all this changes. So they'll go, uh, you know, you and you go off and write this scene, you and you go write that scene, or just let me take it. Or sometimes it's just, let's write it around the table. And we just go. And whoever's running the show is responsible for sort of holding the, the vision, the, the vo voice kind of consistently. Right. And as you know, more and more movies are being written this way, <laughs> which I don't think is a stuff. good thing. Yeah. You know? I, think, I think all the committee writing, whether it's committee like teams of writers or committee teams of executives or development people or note givers, it's all, I think, wrong. And I think it's one of the reasons that movies are getting, in some ways, these kind of studio, big studio movies are getting worse and worse and worse, which is, I really believe a movie with a singular voice, albeit potentially imperfect, is a more satisfying experience than a, quote, perfect, polished, structural film with many different voices, you know? And I think people can tell right. that it doesn't have a solid voice.